Uh, my name is Kofi Boone. I'm an associate professor in landscape architecture here. Uh, so welcome to the College of Design and uh, welcome to my friend Walter. Uh, Walter, I associate with my first time coming to North Carolina. I'm a native of Detroit, Michigan. I uh, went to the University of Michigan. Go Blue. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> uh, and uh, there was a conference at NCANT State that Perry Howard uh, set up, I uh, believe in 19... 94, and they were celebrating the accreditation of a and State's program. It was the first historically black college university to get an accredited landscape architecture program. And as a part of that, they put together this amazing list. So I was a broke grad student, like a few of my broke grad students in the audience right now. I piled up in the back of the car, my faculty advisor, and we drove 12 hours straight from Michigan to North Carolina. And one of the key speakers uh, was Walter, who I didn't know at the time. Uh, and he presented what became uh, the book, Urban Diaries. Uh, and that book put forward the proposition of improvisation in the landscape as valuable, careful observation, attention to culture, uh, really being a part of the communities that you serve. And that's something that inspired me uh, as I finished my graduate career and also my academic and my professional careers. So it's great to come full circle, uh, to see the incredible work that he's done here and across the nation and across the world. And uh, with that, we'd like to welcome you. Tonight, I wanted to talk a little bit about memory. And I was asked to speak in the series in reference to Dix Park and the uh, revitalization of this landscape. Last semester at UC Berkeley, I taught a class on memory with my students. And it was a really wonderful seminar where I asked students a very simple question to go out in the landscape and bring something back. And I was like, what do you mean bring something back? like there's a lot of things that's buried out there. Go out and find something and find a way to bring it back. And so over 15 weeks, the students literally did archaeology within the urban landscape. And it was really wonderful of the kinds of things that different people sought to bring back. And I put that forward because we live in a heterogeneous society, a very diverse culture in America, but we strive for normalcy. We strive for clean, definable things. There is a group of people that make decisions for our taste, and we have to buy into it. They're called standards, right? And there are some bureaucracies that basically maintain those standards, and hopefully there's a growing group of people now fighting to open those things up and begin to question, why do things look the same when you go from place to place? When I think of memory, I, it brings me back to this place. And I remember as a kid, my uncle was a sharecropper, which for years, my memory was my uncle was, had one of the largest farm tracks in North Carolina. I never asked the question to him if he owned the land. It turned out by the time I got 25 years old, I visited him, I said, where's all the land? He said, that was never my land, that was Mr. Wisnot's land. So this notion of these elements that I used to see and used to think belong to my family, my people, they were these borrowed landscapes that were just part of my childhood. They were fleeting. Some of them are still there today and some of them disappeared. But when I think about this landscape in North Carolina, it's a very powerful landscape. I remember playing in bean fields and there would be a stand of trees. And my grandmother or my uncle would say, don't go into those trees. Someone's buried in there. But this notion that life existed around and the landscape was very diverse. It was a challenging landscape. It had bugs. It made noises, right? It was hot, right? I ran a lot. I drank a lot of water. But it was that kind of memory that I get. But opposed to that, that kind of free landscape, I also have a memory of these buildings that kind of jetted out in the landscape. And in the back of my father's Volkswagen, every time we passed Ashboro here, he would go, there goes the devil. And I never understood what he talked about. And we would go around that circle and he would go, the devil's gone. And for a lot of people in this landscape, the devil lived in that building. And you never wanted to go to that building because if you were at that building, it was not a good place to be. And those buildings carry that memory. And then the landscape of the Cape Fear River flowing through Lillington. Somewhere in here, my uncle had a tobacco farm 
and I basically tied tobacco and drove a truck all the way down to the Dairy Queen. That's no longer here. But we used to come in the Dairy Queen and have RC and peanuts mixed together. But those are just these small memories of a child growing up. And years later, coming into contact with these kids in Pittsburgh, it reminded me of all of those things, right? That every now and then you have to go back and remember those things, those innocent things to break out of these standard normative tropes. Because I really believe that if everyone who's a designer, if you followed your memories, we would live in a very diverse place. We would have conversations every day because someone made something that was triggered by a familiar to themselves. And so for you design students who are there, be courageous. When your professor tells you to do something a certain way, if you feel compelled to do it a different way, challenge them. Challenge them. This is what design is all about. And once you start to challenge, you begin to see things anew. I want to share with you some projects or some provocations of projects. Some are real, some are fictions that I find myself embroiled in. I've been living in Oakland, California now for 20 years. It turns out most people in Oakland don't know why it's called Oakland. So we've been talking to people over the last five years to get them to understand that Oakland had oak trees. And when you looked across from San Francisco, those oaks came all the way down to the bay. And people in San Francisco said Oakland, right? And it became a way of thinking about the place. Today, all the oaks are gone. So people living there today who used to not understand a canopy, they don't understand Oakland. So we're trying to bring the oaks back to Oakland. My studio practice is a kind of a hybrid practice between urbanism, art, and landscape. And I like to sort of break up the two in a certain way and talk a lot about objects in the beginning and then talk about landscapes through the lens of memory. I've been trying to do a project in Norfolk, Virginia for the last seven years. We won a competition there and I had never heard of massive resistance. And for a lot of people in Norfolk, massive resistance is this amazing thing that happened. That after Brown versus Board of Education, Virginia said, we're not going to integrate. We're going to keep things the way they are and we'll close our schools. So for the black community, it was mass resistance. For the white kids, the white community, it was a loss. It was, I think it was called the lost summer or something like that. There's two different memories of a thing that happened. And for a year, there was no school in Norfolk. There were these amazing programs of people coming down and talking. So our piece was called Persistent Soliloquy. And it was basically a frame of nine trees riffing on Robert Irwin, where we would actually have the, write, the writings of the day projected digitally and would play as you move through the space. See if I can do this. So you can imagine the words of the day coming from the courts, the words coming from the newspaper, racial slurs, everything. Writing would be three-dimensionalized. But as we worked on three different proposals for this project, it turned out, yeah, thank you, that the mayor at the time and the city manager said that they were not ready. And that was five years ago. I got a call two weeks ago that evidently there's a black mayor in Norfolk and public art said, Walter, I think we're ready. <laughs> so just like that, the memories can change because again, who's actually making those decisions. Another project closer to home that I learned a lot about North Carolina, that North Carolina has 100 counties I was like, wow, it's 100 counties? When you look at the county map of this state? And so this was a provocation for a new park in downtown that had 100 squares, that had 100 large pine, pine trees, that had a digital piece in the pine tree, and every county had an, how could I say, a, a digital record of their memories embedded here. So you imagine Cabarrus County, Mecklenburg County, they would all have a square here and you would come and you could actually learn about the counties. And I was intrigued by this notion that you have this democratic thing that's spread out over a non-democratic terrain. 
Because when you think about it, as you go west, there are less people in certain places, but the counties are actually spread out pretty even across the state, which I never knew. <coughs> or that redwoods used to grow in San Francisco and in some places that you can actually find them in the urban fabric of the city. Or that tables, if you make a big table, a lot of people can sit down together. We made a table 80 feet long in an alley that people never wanted to be in, but people came together in that table. And these are very simple things that I remember that I find through making projects you can bring back. A window. This was a project in an alley in Philadelphia where all the windows in the alleys were boarded up and I couldn't get people to unboard the windows. So we made windows. And it was weird. People came out from the boarded up spaces and sat in the windows, right? But that's a thing, again, these objects that we're attracted to, these familiar things. And so for two years, we made more windows to get people to open up their windows. And this little girl was really taken by it. And couples would come and want their pictures taken in the window. So again, these objects, these very familiar things, they, they reside in our heads, just like canned spinach. Right? I mean, this idea of where our food comes from. Some things are really familiar, and some things are less. Or that the world that we live in, abstractly, we can begin to save it or preserve it. This is Hunter's Point in San Francisco that's being redeveloped. Artist Mildred Howard and myself decided to take a photo of this view that's going away and bring it back in an abstraction. So the view now is a pixelated thing that you can actually walk around. And this used to be an industrial area where artists actually made things of metal. And so it begins to talk of that time that existed and now in this new place. Or in the Bronx, in Brooklyn, people working in community gardens need water. And listening to people talk about that there is no water and that they used to have water and now they have to go to a hydrant to get water. And so we made cups that held the water and pumps that people can actually pump for water. And then we got famous people to pay for it. <laughs> There's also this memory of the triad down below that I remember growing up, we had plates. There was Martin Luther King, John, and Jack. And then my grandmother had a big blanket that had them. And I had forgotten about that. And we were working on a project um, in this African-American neighborhood in Oakland where people kept coming to the meeting saying, we want our heroes. We want to see our heroes on the street. And so I thought about that quilt and those plates. And I also thought of Ernie Barnes, the good times, and all these things. I think Ernie's from North Carolina. Um, but these images in my head of these big breasted women shaking, you know, in the party and these amazing people. And so we actually took a sign from the highway and we actually put our black leaders over the road. And it was 2008 and Obama had just won, so someone had to come out and we put Obama in. But this spans 150 feet, this thing is eight feet tall and it spans over the freeway. And every day at sunset, it lights up, and those heroes are ablazing. And next to it are these dancing lights that riff off of the jazz clubs that used to be here and the Ernie Barnes painting. And these are all giant-sized elements. And the reason why we decided to make everything of scale is it's in a neighborhood where infrastructure came in and basically wiped out an entire neighborhood. And for 25 years, people have been putting back in standard dumb stuff, like trees and tree grates, normative bus stop, and of course, you can't see anything. Plant street trees 25 feet on center. Let's build public housing and then put an Afrocentric sculpture out front. But all of those things, over time, you couldn't see them. And so we decided that the heroes would be seen. So every day, if you're on the train, you see all of this. So you can ask anyone in the East Bay, they know when they're going through this neighborhood because they see Obama, Malcolm X, MLK, emblazed.
This next project has more to do with, I guess, my interest in language, but also my memory of Everett Fly coming to a and State back in the 80s. Everett Fly just got the Presidential Medal of Honor from Obama, and he was one of the first scholars to actually document freedmen towns. And I think Nicodemus, Kansas was one of the first ones. And he was also responsible for the signage that one gets when you go to these places and that you see all over that talks about the Freedmen's Village. And if you don't know what a Freedmen's Village doing reconstruction, there was a Freedmen's Bureau set up and contraband at the time were taken, blacks were taken to a certain area and they had to live in a certain place with certain schools. Arlington Cemetery was the first Freedmen village which is ironic, it was a plantation, Robert E. Lee's, and then it became our national cemetery. And you can go there today. But we were asked to come to this community called Knock. And Knock is right very close to Arlington. And we were asked to create a town square. And I asked them, well, why do you want a town square in Arlington? If you've ever been to Arlington, Arlington is just a big suburb, right? There's like no place to put a square. And they were like, well, our history is being erased, and we're the last vestige of these communities that are descendant from the Arlington Freedmen's town. And so I asked my client, Arlington the Art Commission, to basically give me a van, and we drove around, and I asked them to show me why they wanted this square. And everyone talked about Green Valley. I said, what's Green Valley? Well, Walter, you have to remember, there was a plantation and there was just this big green valley. And we lived in that green valley. And now that green valley is suburbanized. So this was one of the images standing up on the hill, looking back down the hill. So we decided to say, okay, all of the space, including Drew Model School, the space will be green valley and we'll help you try to tell this story. And within this space, there will be these new sort of elements for people to come together, and there will be a commemorative piece. And working with the community, there's a market space, there's a place for you know, all the green infrastructure. But the piece in the middle of it all is this commemorative piece. And we decided, we had this long talk with the community about words. And what does freedom mean? And for a lot of people, there's like freedom there's no freedom. You know, we've never had freedom. There's no place for us to even go and think about freedom. So we started talking about just the word then, freed. And contraband were actually freed, right? They didn't arrive, right? Freedom, but someone came up and said, you're free, you're free, you're free. So there was an objectifier tied to it. And so we talked a lot about how do we represent this? Now, during that time of when people were contraband, uh, you had to wear a badge. In Charleston, South Carolina, I think all the way up to the Mason-Dixon line. And whoever you were, you had a badge and you had a number, and you basically said what it, what it was you did. And so we're making a piece on Freed made up of contraband badges, and they'll have names of the early freed men and freed women who will be there, and anyone who wants to be freed in the neighborhood. This is like 36 feet tall, and it'll light up at night and it's gilded, it's in gold. And it will be in this community space. Riffing on the same gold, in Iowa, we started working with this liberal arts college, Grinnell, and they're in the middle of what I would call Louis Sullivan's jewel box territory for all you architects. And these jewel boxes, you go inside and you just want to give them your money. I mean, it's like architecture nirvana. You walk in, there's stained glasses, there's detail, giving your money to the cashier. I mean, everything is designed. But also, there are these griffins that are out front. And I didn't know much about Louis Sullivan's work until coming to Grinnell and I started noticing that he used griffins a lot. That this classical use of the guardian right in front of the architecture. So we were asked to come here and do a space that's located next to Taco John's, a gas station, a hamburger joint, check cashing place, 
another gas station. Grinnell, the college is right down here. And the college bought, bought this land and said, Walter, it's a vacant space and we need a gateway. I was like, in the middle of Iowa, I could do something, right? So we decided, archaeologically, we found that there were houses that once sat on the site and there were barns. And these houses and barns actually made a pattern that was erased in the downtown. So we're bringing those back. And then we decided to make this menagerie of these elements that I found throughout the community. There's the griffin, he has wings. There was a gas station that has a giant mercury that has wings. They made buggies here. So the buggies had wings. And then the school's icon has wings. And I'm like, in this town, there's all these winged things. So we came up with this idea called the Crossword Guardians. And so there are these giant 30 foot tall menageries of these winged animals that are gilded in gold. So you arrive at the crossroads and you know you're at a different place, right? And that you move through these spaces. And this is at the scale of this kind of industrial work. And the idea started to evolve out of the Iowa landscape where all you see is welded wire metal just moving through the landscape and these pieces of metal now become these golden jewels that become the iconography for the downtown. If Iowa has jewels, the University of Virginia in Charlottesville has a lawn. And that lawn, as we know, is very revered. And over the last, I guess, 10 years now, the lawn moved to the south. And if you've been to the University of Virginia, there's now a south, a south lawn. And it's actually a kind of a bridge, bridged over the road. But I had the opportunity working with Cheryl Barton and others to think about the site where a free black woman, her remains were found as they were digging for um, the, the building in the South Lawn. Now south of the lawn, there was basically a ravine, and it was a place called Canada. And we think Canada was called that way because free blacks came to live in this area. But it was bottom land. Everything from the Acumenico village drains down to this place. So this place still gets really, really wet. When they found the remains, they asked the design team if we could come up with a scheme that dealt with this cultural landscape. And I had remembered reading Michael Vlach, Del Upton and others, particularly Back of the Big House by Del Upton, where he talked about that slaves and free blacks in the, how can I say, the setting of these formal institutions created their own ad hoc ways of moving through landscapes. So that it circum circumvented, right, the diagram. Right, so you can imagine on a plantation, instead of going down the alley, you went around the backside. And so my first scheme was all these squiggle lines all over the campus, and they were like, Walter, this is way too much. So you can kind of see the only squiggles that are left are a few located here. But what we were trying to do was to be different than the rest of the campus to call attention to this cultural landscape. And then at the last minute, I wanted to almost be spiritual in the sense that when I was, again, raised here in the South, every time we went to a funeral, I remember taking poinsettias or, or flowers, and there was always the tin foil, and you turn the tin foil back, right? And that's when the sun hit it, got a flash. And that's when the spirit goes to heaven, right? So I came up with this notion of the shadow catcher, and it's basically a stainless steel roof overhead that gives a shadow on the ground. And it tries to deal with this idea of, of darkness and light, simultane the simultaneous action. So when there's no sun, there's no shadow. But when the sun comes out, you have these two things, and this is Kitty Foster's portal. And that portal allows her and her ancestors to constantly keep this place safe, but also to be here and be part of the memory. It's probably the only modern kind of element in this zone here. And a little story, I was uh, lecturing in Philadelphia at the Philadelphia Flower Show, and this very wonderful elderly white couple comes up to me after my lecture, 
And I said, you're Mr. Hood. I'm like, yes. Well, we're just going through the flower show and we were tired. So we just sat down and then we noticed you're talking and we said, we think we know this guy. I was like, yeah. And he goes, thank you so much. It's like, for what? I said, the shadow catcher. We love the shadow catcher. It started us all talking in Charlottesville about things we would never talk about before. I was like, wow, okay, thank you. Um, but it's, it's those kinds of things that it's not only the memories that you put out there, but hopefully they get reciprocated. And every time I've gone back here, I've met someone along the way. The last time I was here for an interview for another job, there was a couple just walking up and they said, you know, this place like talks about its history, it talks about everything. And they were just walking from here. And they were making their way back up. And now there's a new monument that's being built there now to the enslaved workers uh, who built most of the campus. So as you can see with the object, I mean, objects are fun things, right? Because you can create, how can I say, different or mixed messages and be more diverse. Where I think landscapes are these things that become more codified, right? Gardens and parks, these are harder, right? A lot of these things, the plazas, the squares, the streets, they're coming from somewhere else and particularly the West, when we think about the European precedents for a lot of the things. But I would say one of the great things about having Dick's Park on the plate is, I, I would argue that parks are an American invention, right? That they should reflect, right, this heterogeneous makeup because they really are invented here, unlike a lot of the other typologies. Galen Krantz writes this really wonderful account of the politics of parks design pretty much for the 20th century. And it shows how culture and politics and economics really changed that typology and created a series of models that are, I think, uniquely American, even though we still keep looking at them through this Euro lens. I think this is the place. I mean, if we go back to Olmsted, he will talk about place and we'll talk about the differences of place. And landscapes, there's no truth to landscapes, right? I mean, ecological historians now will say, you know, they are what they are. Right? This is the Bro Museum. This landscape sits on top of a freeway cap. If you walk down the street, you would think of this amazing thing, but underneath it is no dirt at all. It's like trucks running. But this notion that we can create fictions in landscape, these are 120-year-old olive trees on that same cap. Someone walked there could think, well, these trees have been here all at the same time. But we can tell different stories with landscape. And that, unlike the object, I think allows us to share and have this amazing, very dense conversation. Landscapes can talk about geology. They can talk about people. This is Jackson Hole, where we worked for five to six years on the sculpture terrace. And this is where the glacier came through. If you didn't, never understood Jackson Hole, if you go here and stand right here, that moraine, it's as flat as any landscape I've ever seen for miles. And you can actually see the glacier. And that's now where the elk come back and lose their horns. But this landscape is a big landscape. And we have to work with people here to get out of their cars. Right? It's one of the most urban places I've ever been. This space was a parking lot. We talked them to get rid of one third of their cars so that people could actually see the landscape. And once you get rid of all that familiar stuff, you can actually see landscape. So in our cities, when you have streets, you have cars, you have houses, you have stuff that has scale, you can't see landscape. But you remove all of that. You start to see the most minute scales of things. So sometimes we just have to like get stuff out of the way so that we can see things. Because when you get them out of the way, people just do the weirdest things. This was like opening day. It's like, we're going to do yoga at 8 in the morning because they are compelled to do it. Right? Again, and I do think it's something about how we see that context, how we see that environment. The De Young Museum is about 12 years old now. This is a fiction. Who's, ever, who's been to San Francisco, Golden Gate Park? This was a giant sand dune. Olmsted came here and was like, do not build a park here. Build a park on Vaness, make a promenade because that's where your prevailing winds are, but do not build a park here. Because this was all sand. You know what it took to build this park? They had to decapitate a lot of hills, bring a lot of dirt in, 
If you go out there with a bottle of water, just pour it in the ground, it'll just disappear. The sand will always be sand. It's a fiction. And this is during a time of California and Australia sharing different things from eucalyptus trees to redwood trees. And this is a very particular period. But at this museum, all we did was use plants that are in this fiction, and we just used them in different ways. The palm trees were gifts 100 years ago, so everything has a story here. The stone was taken from an old abandoned quarry. The ferns were given to them by Australia. There was a historic fountain that we had to put back together over to the left. And there were new donors who gave new money for children and people to experience environment. And along the way, I decided that I needed to make more fog. And this might sound funny, but when you're in San Francisco for a long time, you forget it's foggy. And working for five years in the park, I would go out in coats in the beginning, by the end, t-shirt. You forget the environment. And so every hour on the hour, fog comes out. And out of nowhere, children appear. Because they remember. But this idea that landscape can recall different things where a lot of the shale, a lot of the paving is all about sand. Right? And we're like literally looking at the, under the microscope at that sand and what it's made of. That's the Pacific Rim that's made of all of these colors. So the landscape literally becomes that color. And then in certain areas, you get a completely new landscape. This is the place where um, the Asian museum set at this place. So you never had that view of the hill. And you never had this view of the Japanese tea garden because there was a building here. So when you're in the Japanese tea garden looking this way, you never saw a building. You saw a wall. And so for a lot of people in the Japanese tea garden, this is completely new memory and vice versa. That's unfolding. And within two years, the plants just took off because they didn't have light. And all of a sudden, now they have light. Now we're up to New York. I've always wondered in Manhattan why it was so noisy in the morning. You know, when you're in a hotel, you always hear jackhammers. Have you ever been in New York and not hear jackhammers? Right? It's because it's on a big, big rock. And the rock is schist. It's a big, big thing of schist. And they have to literally, anytime you dig, you got to blow it up. And schist is just beautiful color. It's got this beautiful quartz in it. We started working at the Cooper Hewitt redesigning their garden. And the story of the garden is it's a Carnegie mansion, right? They had horses on Fifth Avenue, right across from um, the Mechanics Gate. But it's also, unbeknownst to us, had a famous design by Shimmerhorn. And it had a rockery, which I had never seen a rockery, never designed a rockery, and it had a formal balcony. This is when it was an estate, and it had a lawn. And that lawn has existed over the last 60 years as this place for mothers to come with their kids in the morning or their nannies to come with their kids in the morning and use the space. And it was open like nine to five. But with the reopening, we were asked to reimagine the space. And I immediately was drawn to the reservoir and the relationship between the park and the actual garden. And could we make one larger thing so that when this landscape was animated, this one was animated as well. And then, this being a federal project, using the Shimmerhorn design to articulate that the existing conditions had nothing to do with that one and that we could bring it almost, we could tell that story and connect the two. Now, what I'm not saying is the director wants this to be open 24 hours and need more paved space because they want more programming. Right? I mean, so that was a big kind of push. But the story was really clear that we could actually go back and understand how that rockery functioned and then actually made it larger with the new cafe. And then using the planting, which is city beautiful planting, not Olmsteadian planting, as another argument to have a lot of ornamental plants. Because when you go around, again, the uh, reservoir, you can actually find the rhododendron mile and you can actually find 
other types of plantings that are pedagogical. You can actually get the names of them. And so we can figure out when the cherries bloom on the other side of the rope, our cherries will bloom. And then pretty much redoing all the planting and the paving to make the garden more sustainable. And the garden opened up last summer and it's been heavily programmed. But along the way, we were gonna make this rockery out of going to the quarry. But then we started digging and sure enough, we found rocks. And we found enough rocks to actually build our own rockery. And it's now in its second year. I've never designed a rockery. Rockeries are just rocks with plants, right? Um, but the garden is this amazing kind of forecourt public space that almost operates like a park, but also operates as a private garden. Um, and it's a place now where the cafe spills out the lawn and the reservoir is right across the way. But that memory going back to that early watercolor sketch of being here and being able to grab that piece of water and make this one of the largest gardens in Manhattan. The Bayview Opera House is a 18, I wanna say 1880s, tilt up wood opera house that was built by the Hunters brothers in South San Francisco. It served as an opera house for a while, and then it became a bar, and then a community center. By the mid-60s, Bayview was under major attack because most of the African Americans who were living in downtown was actually pushed south of the city to Bayview. It's one of the most beautiful landscapes to put public housing. I mean, lots of public housing. And of course, during the riots, there were shootings here, and the residents actually took refuge in the Opera House. We were asked to work with the city to make it ADA compliant. And so, our first meeting, we go, and this young brother comes up, and he says, Mr. Hood, can I take the mic? And I said, sure. And he looked at everybody, he goes, I can just make one phone call and I'll shut this fucker down. He goes, we are not living on a plantation. Why do we have chickens? Why do our kids need to know where their food comes from? Why do we have AstroTurf? This is an opera house. Why can't we have music? Why can't we have belly? And he just went on and on. And I was like, speak, brother, speak, right? I mean, he's telling the truth, right? Because this place had become a defunct community center where every, how can I say, social cultural trope was being used, right? Oh, this is a poor neighborhood. Okay, we need a community garden. So a landscape architecture firm came in, did some bales of hay. Next to this really beautiful building, bales of hay, bad community garden. Oh, let's do some husbandry. Let's get some chickens. They got some chickens. Teach the kids the chickens. And it was the grossest place I've ever been. Right? And this guy got up and spoke the truth. And so I came up with this diagram and said to the city, I'm only going to work on this. The community is coming back to embrace this building. And we have to figure out a way to make the building open to the community so that when the building the facility is closed, they can use the landscape. So we came up with this idea, literally my, my arms became arms. So we did a floating walkway. And this floating walkway basically takes you all around this building to a stage and a landscape so that when the buildings close, the public still has a way in. And the arts program, there's no community garden. There is beautiful plants that attract butterflies and there's birds. There's lighting, there's wood, there's glass. There's rocks and there's children. And the children now have a safe place to get to and be. They can use the stage on the backside to learn theater and dance. And it's a place that really belongs to the community. And out of that one little mantra, you know, instead of trying to do a handicap ramp, just this notion of a floating walkway literally became a mantra for the community to come back to a building well over 100 years old. 
And on opening day, Nancy Pelosi, I mean, everybody wanted to be here because the community literally came out and they used this building. So if you're ever in San Francisco, look for the Bayview Opera House and their programs. They're pretty fantastic. This next project is in Nashville. It's called Witness Walls. Um, this is a competition that we won four years ago. And unbeknownst to me, like Norfolk, Nashville had a civil rights period. Uh, they were one of the first to actually stage boycotts and sit-ins. Diane Nash and others helped from Fisk University help to desegregate the lunch counters. And they were one of the first to do it. They were so good that we didn't hear about it. Done. Right? And so this notion that this place then is this nucleus of where a lot of the freedom rights, a lot of the sit-ins, and a lot of the protesting actually happened. We were privy to their archive. And during the time, I guess it's 1967, 68, the newspaper sent out their photographers to photograph those people raising hell. And they just photographed people, and they never published them. So someone found in you know, this warehouse all of these photos that have now become the archive for um, the civil rights movement. The piece is a public art piece, very meager uh, funding. Uh, it's not a memorial, not a commemorative piece, but it was a public art piece to say something about civil rights. This is Freddie. This is opening day of the piece. Now the piece is a series of walls made of concrete, and in the concrete there's two types of images that are etched. One's photo real images, and the others are collages that I reconstructed using their photographs based on Christian paintings. Now Freddie, that's Freddie, where's my pointer? That's Freddie right there. And I didn't know this, right? I also didn't know, I, if you ever saw Eyes on the Prize, Freddie is the gentleman who goes from Georgia all the way through Alabama on the Freedom Rides. He, he, he fights through the explosions, the beatings, the jail, and all. And I didn't know this until I went back and saw it, that I heard his voice and it was Freddie. Now I say that because this construction that I did had nothing to do with the community. I was taken by these images and I created these constructions. This image of this cop, this cop is posing. I mean, he's posing, right? And so, again, when you look at a lot of these images from 50 years ago, they could have happened yesterday. This young girl came up to me and says, is this from Baltimore? I said, no, it's from 50 years ago. But this idea that there are these real images and then there are these other images. And I was really taken by the women taking their kids to school. And they had a lot of images of these proud mothers taking these beautiful patent leather, shoe wearing, beautiful girls and boys to school. And these murals begin to depict that. And everything is in concrete, smooth, and black aggregate. And when you get up close, and what I was trying to create was, again, this memory in the wall that you could touch. And at certain times of day when there's no light, there's no image. So it's almost spooky in that the, the images actually live in the wall. And these are all vertical CNC cut. So when the light rakes on it, the images come out. But it's this duality that the witness walls tries to provoke. And it's a place where people can come and sit and reflect on the images, right? There's no text. There's nothing that says Nashville was the first. It's a very subjective piece. And this is one of the civil rights um, marchers. She's just turned 90 years old, and she's one of the most beautiful people I've ever met. <coughs> Are we doing on time? Okay. So the last project I'd like to share with you um, kind of talks a lot about a lot of these things that I've been going on about memory. And one thing I would like you to take away from this lecture is these are my memories, right? And it took me a long time to get to a point where I didn't feel like I had to justify 
right? My memories, right? In the beginning of practice, when I started, I thought I had to emulate someone else, right? There was no one that I could see doing something that I could say, God, that person's just doing what they feel like, right? A lot of us are not as um, privileged. I talk a lot about this with my students. I would love to sit in my studio and just make art and not think about race, class. I would just love to make, make stuff, but I can't. I'm always reminded of something. Reminded of the policeman holding a gun over me. Reminded of being in the back of a seat of a car. Reminded of my father saying, there goes the devil, right? To me, that's the privilege to a certain degree. But it's taken a while that I can make projects now that clients don't look at me and go, well, he's an African-American landscape architect. Right? Come and work on this low-income housing project. Come and are you an MBE? Right? You know, all of those acronyms that put you in a box. And again, I would say to those of you who don't feel privileged, you can be privileged through the courage of your own convictions and your own ideas. And don't let anyone tell you that you can't. And for me, I've just been lucky. It's a place called California. Um, when I moved to California, I had some really great mentors who said, what are you afraid of? You know, the Randy Hesters of the world, the Garrett Ekbos of the world, the Spiro Kostas of the world, the Lars Lareps of the world, who just said, what are you afraid of? You know, and for a while on the East Coast, I was very afraid because everyone said, you have to think this way. You have to think this way. And now even when I come to the East Coast, people go, oh, that's that crazy guy from California. No, I'm from North Carolina, right? I just now have that freedom to talk about things that for a long time I didn't have a context to talk about them. This last project is a very important project. It's the International African American Museum in Charleston, South Carolina. Joe Riley, our most amazing mayor in the world, um, fought really hard to have a museum in Charleston that tells this story that I can't believe we didn't know. Right? And these are these, these memories. It's like someone remembered. And why are we only now remembering? Right? which also reminds me of J.B. Jackson's Necessity for Ruin, right, where Jackson talks about there needs to be a time of neglect in this country. We have to forget before we can bring something back. Right? That's why it's been 50 years that we can talk about civil rights now. Right? There's a time of neglect. Right? Everybody wants to do a 50-year anniversary of something. Oh, the 50th year anniversary of the riots in Detroit. It's happening next month. The 50th anniversary of the riots, blah, blah, blah. why couldn't we celebrate it? Five years, three years, four years, but this time of neglect. This is the aquarium landscape in Charleston. Who's been to Charleston? Right. The aquarium is located over here. We started out thinking about what should this garden be? And why do a garden? And the reason why this garden is here, this is a place called Gadsden's Wharf. And Gadsden's Wharf was one of the largest single wharfs and docks in North America. I think it stretched eight blocks back towards town. So literally, you have to go eight blocks back towards town and along all the way down to the ferry terminal. And it was a place where we believe at least 40 to 45 percent of the African diaspora landed before they were moved along the Horn. We know that the food chain of the Bay, Charleston Bay, changed during this time because blacks were held up in these mosquito houses here, brought in, sold. There was a warehouse located on Gaston's Wharf where they were housed. If you died, they just threw you overboard. So the shark feeding came all the way up. We also know this is a place where a lot of people perished. And we also know this is a place where a lot of individuals were sold. We were asked to come in and really think about what kind of landscape or what kind of space could be appropriate. 
I got a call from Harry Cobb of Pay Cobb Free, and Harry said, Walter, this building's about landscape and structure, because this is in a hurricane zone. So the building sets up 14 feet off the ground, right, and it's held up by two meter sets of columns. We have a memorial advisory committee made up of local um, politicians, uh, business people, and academics. And I was asked to create a process and then come up with a design that talked about some of these ideas. And so starting out, we went to Sullivan's Island. And the thing at Sullivan's Island that blew my mind was there's a bench by Toni Morrison. You might know of these benches that she's placed in very important, she thinks important places throughout the US. There's one in New Orleans, I think. There's one in Charleston. I think there might be another one in Texas. But her whole point is there's no places for African Americans to go and think about their ancestors. There's no real place. Now Sullivan Island is a real place. These are where those mosquito houses were. These are where blacks perish and that, that they were. But look at all these people. This is the only thing on Sullivan's Island that has anything to do with people of African descent. A bench. And it's a bad bench. I mean, it's a pretty awful bench, right? And a piece of tabby paper. Everything else is military. Civil War military. It's the only thing. And Michael Allen, who's standing there, is telling us that before Toni Morrison was able to get her chair there, he fought for 15 years just to get a sign. But that entire landscape does not say about any, there's no other story other than the military story. We went to the site, and there's the old line. That's where the new world began for a lot of people. And you can kind of see there's the map of Gaston's Wharf. It was this entire piece. But we were able to initiate where that line was. In our first meeting, I asked the civil engineering, have you done the archaeology? No one had done archaeology. Joe Riley said, when can we do archaeology? Right? And of course, everybody's like, oh, we've got hazmat. And it's like, there's no hazmat. Dig. And of course, they dug, and they actually found Gaston Forth. But again, why didn't anyone ask the question? Someone knew. A scholar wrote the piece. Uh, the article came out uh, seven years ago. Someone had, had to have known that all of this was going on here. We marked the line. Then we went to Middleton Place. Middleton Place is really Middleton Plantation. All you landscape students who, this is the first colonial garden, this is a plantation, right? It's called Middleton Place. We went there and we were told, again, a lot of things that didn't talk about what we wanted to talk about. And of course the scholars, she's from Haiti, she was just, I felt sorry for this guy because she was asking, who, who made that? Who made that? Who made that? Who made that? And by the end he was just like, okay. Slaves made everything, okay? Um, and we also drove around and looked at these communities where there's this tradition in the low country when the plantation ceased to operate, the free slaves were actually deeded over land next to the plantation. So all of these little territories, Phillips, Six Mile, Scanlonville, Phillips, these are Gullah communities. And they're still pretty much have maintained their memory and their culture within these places and they're slowly being eradicated. Right? And so the museum, in a way, will be a place for you to go, one, and find your identity. You could search, but it's also a place, a community space for people who are being pushed out, who need to be empowered. We took a boat out to Sullivan's Island, and it's pretty prophetic. I mean, just to go out into the water and come back. Then we inventoried a lot of the things that we thought were really important, from craftsmanship to imagery to garden design. And the first idea that was floated was this idea of clouds and figures. And the idea was underneath the building, the Brooks maps would be actually cast one to one. If you don't know the Brooks map, it's the first lithograph that was done depicting how the slaves were crammed into boats as cargo, head to foot, head to foot, head to foot. And that became a pattern that's overhead and on the ground as you look back out towards the Atlantic. 
that it would fill up with water and go away. And then recede back again. And this might happen every hour on the hour. So when you're there, you might think it's just water. The water would waste away, and you would actually see figures full scale on the ground. And we had this other idea about <laughs> projections. Um, and the committee agreed to all, and we moved forward. And the landscape is pretty much what I call a colonial garden under a building that talks about the low country and uses right, this memory of this place, because this is how a ground, to give people a place to come and think about your ancestors. The entire ground is tabby. To the north, the landscape literally creeps in under the building to create what I call an Afro-colonial garden, where we're actually taking parterres and transforming them through this kind of improvisational material art way, using the kind of the techniques of brick, <coughs> materials, shade, epiphytes, and then craft, and mixing all of those things together and have them create an aesthetic of a place. And then layered on top of that, working with RAA, who is doing most of the interior, and they've done the work um, in Washington, D.C., thinking about the pedagogical displays and how these might be interpreted. But every piece really tries to get people to think about where they are in a different way, and to get people to sort of understand history through a tactile as well as a material way. The building is going to be these specially made white bricks, and that'll get honed into the landscape as well through the walls. We have local artists from Philip Simmons commissioning wrought iron to have, you know, again, real contemporary. His son now is an iron worker, and he'll make the new iron work. And then being able to use the material to talk about what's underfoot, and that this used to be a wharf. And we're working with this wonderful paving contractor who's able to go out into the Atlantic and scrape the bottoms and give us all types of shales. And again, we're really interested in that kind of diaspora from South Carolina down to Florida and how that might change the way you think about right, that geology below the sea. And then using that as a way to talk about where people come from. One of the powerful things I think about this place is going to be it's 24-7. So if you've been in Charleston and you've walked through the cemeteries at night, it'll have that same quality, right? That it's part of the public realm and you can go through. It's not precious. It's an everyday landscape. And then at the warehouse, there are kneeling figures that begin to talk about the atrocities that happened as you're sandwiched in between these two thick walls. And the stories are told whether it's about the atrocities um, or whether it's about something more uplifting. Where people are coming from, we're working with our committees to really talk about that through installations of audio, but also using materials um, to make steles so people can actually leave offerings. Again, creating these sort of epiphyte walls where people might leave um, messages and things based on the scrim and actually constructing these more site-specific pieces that actually become part of the vocabulary. These are our sweet grass uh, planters where you could actually grow um, rice uh, for exhibitions, but it's also helping with the drainage off of the roof and really trying to bring that low country landscape in and a lot of the furnishings really trying to create an aesthetic for this new place. The landscape is, is really challenging because how do you create ritual space, right? I mean, we know when you go to a church or some institutions are created or have the formal capacity to create ritual. And we know we have the Atlantic Ocean and we have this building up ahead. And one of the powerful things, I think, of the Brooks map is you don't need to, how can I say, you don't need writing to tell you what you're looking at. Uh, and this will be interpreted up in the building up above. But we kept coming back 
to this image. And this is the image that was at Sullivan's Island, which is like this map has been copied a million times, right? But there's something wonderful about the tapestry. And we had these long conversations with the committee about putting a body on the ground and people stepping over bodies. Well, what does that mean? Or should this place be that audacious, right? Or should it be a little bit more reserved, right? And we've chose to say, no, it should be audacious. <laughs> it should be big. And so we're creating this infinity fountain. It's about the size of a football field, right? That'll be at the new edge because we sit above tide so we want to create this fiction when you're under the building, you see the water as if that water is back in the place that it used to be. So it's sitting up on the bulkhead and there's about that much water. And during its cycle, in about an hour, all of that water can drain out. And when the water drains out, we're actually getting relics from Bunch Island that might be a piece of stone, might be a piece of this jetty, that'll take you across the water. And we're actually casting the bodies full scale in tabby. And so this is the relief. And imagine hundreds of these laid out in the fountain. So looking back towards the west, towards the east, when the fountain, the piece from Bunch Island is here, and then the water starts to well up. It was as if the fountain is actually crying and it wells up and then it all disappears. And then within the cycle, it all floats back out. So you can imagine when you come here, that cycle would be part of your visit as you move through this landscape. This landscape is supposed to start next year. This should be open by 2020. And hopefully this project carries with the site, all of the memories of the people making them, as well as the people who live in Charleston. Thank you so much. Thank you, Walter. Uh, thank you for sharing your work. It was very powerful. I thought the, the Brooks map was um, uh, particularly impressive. Uh, for exactly what you said, the, the audacity of it. Um, we, I think you well know that the Dix has a similar challenge. There's probably, uh, you know, there are a few marked graves <laughs> compared to the, the number of bodies that are probably buried there. Um, and there are also similarly uh, nameless people. <coughs> Do you have any ideas about how that, that you know, the scale of how that um, should be recognized? And, you know, it's such a large park. How, how much of it should be devoted to memory? And, and what, what should the scale of that be? Well, I think it all should be devoted to memory. Um, I mean, there's something there. So it's not like there's nothing there. Um, and, you know, I think the designers are up to, to task to do it. But again, it's how I started out. You know, every place is different. You know, and I, I don't have an answer for what to do at Dix Park, but I hope it's different than any other place in the world. <laughs> you know, I think that's the challenge of, of, of making places, right? I mean, the challenge should be that every place is different and every place has different stories to tell, right? And different things to sort of bring back and bring out. And that to me is what's most compelling about designing in places, right? I mean, to come to a place and, and be here, you know, and, and try to understand what does that mean to, to have a burial ground in a park? It means something completely different here in North Carolina than it does in California, than it does in Iowa, right? Again, I started out with these kinds of landscapes, right? I mean, North Carolina to me is a, is a landscape of haints and ghosts and it's all this really great storytelling and lies and all kinds of stuff all rolled into one. And I think deeper as you get into sub certain sub cultures, you actually have the, the opportunity and almost the privilege to say something different. Right? You know what I mean? 
And so I don't have an answer, uh, but I would love to like, you know, be enmeshed in that conversation. Um, yes, sir. Hey, man, how are you? I didn't see you there. Good. <laughs> nice to see you. Um, you can't have a good time, first of all, because of the Dixon project that we're doing. But this morning I was reading Christophe DeRose's work. Mm. Recently he's been writing about landscape, contemporary mm -hmm. landscape history. And one of the things he says is that landscape uh, is uh, a schism, right? There's a schism between landscape and science. It seems that science seems to be in control of how decisions are made about mm -hmm. the landscape. So uh, it's good that you're talking to you because it's very much uh, a reaffirmation that landscape is a cultural part of that, right? Yeah. And I think you would agree with that. But here, the idea is uh, we've dealt with this. So how have we come across this idea today? Is it really science? I mean, you, you bring up some other issues about uh, the dominant culture being right. against the dominant landscape. Right. So what are your thoughts on that? I mean, I mean the science is there. Um, you know, a lot of our projects were called into fix stuff, right? I mean, and you can choose to, like, stick your head in there and just fix things. And I have good friends. Like, I just like fixing things. Or you can say, yeah, but that's kind of baseline, right? I mean, in a way, that's baseline. Right? It's like the Bayview Opera House thing. It's like for 10 years, the city couldn't figure out how to do an ADA ramp, right? Because they kept trying to fix the front door. And if you saw the front door and the stairs, they kept trying to figure out how to fix that. And a lot of the times, if we go into this more rational, using science broadly, the more rational way without having a set of questions first, you're always going to end up in the same place. And, and I think, you know, what we say in the studio is that, you know, we're, we're not a service firm. So if you want someone to lay out parking lots in the best way, don't hire me. But if you're interested in, like, having a parking lot that's socially relevant and a cool, hire me. Right? And so, again, it's how I think you look at these things. And, you know, I try to tell my students, there's like these baseline things. It's like grading and drainage. Learn it. And then don't think about it anymore. You know, the last time it's like, oh, I'm a good grader. Bring it to me and I can grade it all day. It's like, that's baseline. You know, inspire me with the ground now. Right? Asplund me. You know, make, make the ground say something to me. That's a little different. So I think you really have to sort of navigate things in a different way. The other thing is, I think if you're open to looking at things in an acute way, you actually see these amazing mimetic appropriations happening in the landscape. Uh, at the UVA, we did this tour of rural cemeteries, right? Because at the Foster House, there was like all of these, you know, remains, and some of them were male, female, but there were animals, and so we were trying to figure out how did people deal with their dead during that time. And you would go to these cemeteries, and everyone's like looking at kind of, oh wow, that's kind of like formal, da, da, da. And the thing that caught my eye was in every cemetery you went, the ground literally sunk. And I started like going, wow, why is that? You go to every cemetery, everyone was concave. And then I asked someone, it's like, when the body decomposes, the air, literally, and, and based on this geology in this area, it basically sumps. And that's why our burial ground looks that way. Because we were turned on by the form of the landscape, that's something you saw, not the kind of formal capacity. So a lot of the times, these things are like right in front of you, right? And that's where the science comes in, when you start asking the right questions. I don't know if I answered your question. Um, out of all the projects, yeah, that I'm showing you today, there, there was always some courageous person who just stuck their neck out. I can, in every one of those projects, there was someone with the city, the county, the nonprofit, 
who says, we got to do this. And they basically took the hits. Right? They shielded us. They took the hits. When people said, oh, you can't close that road. Yes, we can close that road. Right? Or uh, we, we got to have, on the witness wall, we, we got to have Martin Luther King. We got to have this. No, we don't. It's an art piece. Let the artist do his work. That someone is always, and that's your client. You know, and I think if you want to have the best park, the best design, take the bullets. Because again, you want, you want to take risks, right? You want to take risks. If you don't want to take risks, you know what it's going to look like. I can tell you what it looks like. It's going to be some grass, some trees, some pathways, bike lanes, Picnic tables, barbecues, basketball courts, a uh, little wrought iron thing around the cemetery. You know what that is. Take some risk. And that means you really have to step back and say, do we really want something that's going to do something for all of us? You know, that's one way to get there, knowing where we are, right? Is it something that is going to do something for all of us? And what does that look like and smell like? I don't know what it looks like and smells like. I have yet to get a commission where someone says, make it for all of us and we'll back you. There are very few places like that. That looks strange. You walk in, it's like, what the, there's something weird, but I want to be here, right? I mean, that's the kind of thing I think you have the opportunity to do. As you can imagine, Central Park was probably the strangest thing for the first 20 years. It was this big, flat, wet, little dwarf tree thing in the middle of this island. I mean, think about when people took risk. We don't take risk anymore. Think about, you know, the Hoover Dam. You been to the Hoover Dam? God, that's a lot of concrete. Can you imagine doing that today? Someone like, we're gonna make something big, thick, poche, yeah. We're going to do it, and we're behind you. There's, there's no, you don't get a lot of will. You get it for museums, somehow. Someone comes up with $220 million to do some skin. It's pretty freaking amazing. No, really, I was just at the, the um, Louis Vuitton thing. Amazing. Glass. Someone came up with $500 million for a building. Why can we be audacious with a box and can't be audacious with a landscape? It's kind of weird that way, right? I mean, we've got the weirdest boxes out there, and we will pay a lot of money. We were just talking about it in the studio. It's like, when will someone just go, so here's 500 million for a landscape. You know, we're working on a tech project right now, and it's like, landscape is 30 million, which means the billion's what? 300 million. Right? I mean, these are the kinds of things that we're talking about. And then when we look at what we're actually spending our public dollars on, it's, it's meager. And then we want it to be amazing. You know, and I think that's, again, why we see ourselves in this pop-up culture. Right? The pop-up is it's exciting us because it looks different. But it's not different, it's just temporary. And we're afraid to make really hard choices. And we would rather like, oh, we're cool. We got pink chairs on the side of a sidewalk, right? We're able to do that. Close the frickin' road. Get rid of the road. Who will be the first to say, we don't need any more freeways? It's killing us. Who's going to be the first? Those are the kinds of things that are going to be transformative. And so I think if you can use this process to really talk about, you know, why does it take so long to go from one side of the town to the other in these things? You know, why aren't more people out walking, right? Why aren't there more black and white people together, you know, in this place, right? And those are questions that, you know, basketball courts are not going to solve. You know, it's really going to, like, force people to be really creative and think about what's really important. Okay? You guys get me all hyped up. <laughs> yes, sir. So a lot of this reminded me of uh, a passage in the fire next time when Baldwin says, history is not the past, it's the present that we carry it with us. Mm -hmm. And we have to for a little more. And it seems like it's really difficult to be in spaces and be reminded of what happened there and 
can not carry that with you and then do something to improve your material conditions. So do you ever design these spaces with that in mind? With, uh, and, and do you see landscape design as something that is political as, instead of just making like a cultural space? Mm -hmm. And reminding these people, do you, do you see it as being a space or do you create with the purpose of maybe inspiring people to take collective action yeah. that is political? Well, I'm hoping, I, I, I hope, you know. It's really hard. I mean, that's it's a difficult thing. But the sort of progressive ideas that you can kind of embed in these typologies, for no better word. I'm, I'm writing a lot about this right now. This notion of conscious and unconscious hybrids that, you know, if I get a job and someone says, design me a park, right? All of a sudden now, I got to deal with parkness. <laughs> Right? I mean, so is there something I can co-op, right, in the park that can empower, that might take me in a different way? And that's where it gets really difficult because the typology has been codified to death. And there are certain people that a park to you is like, that doesn't look like a park, Walter. That's got way too much paving. Right? I mean, we have these ideas, and so how do you begin to kind of deal with that? But I do think there are these pieces, you know, that you can begin to kind of pull out. And I do think it's how people sort of operate. Um, Lafayette Square Park was done 20 years ago in Oakland downtown, and it was done at a time when the mayor of San Francisco was pushing all their homeless out. We were able to get $1.2 million, it's like mid-90s, we built a restroom, we put in barbecue pit smokers, you know, smokers. Um, we put in a, a canopy, horseshoes, picnic tables, a tot lot. We crammed as much program into a thing because people called it Lafayette Square Park. And I was like, well, why is it a compound? And it's a square, it's one city square, but it had become a park where people came there to do park-like things. And so we crammed it. You go there today, Oakland is having one of its worst homeless problems that I've ever seen in my 20 years there. People are living on tents on the sidewalk. But at Lafayette Square, they're actually living in tents in the park. And they actually have restrooms. It's the only public restroom in the whole city. Now, you would think someone in the city would go, hmm, 20 years ago, we built a bathroom there, and look what it's doing for these people today. Yeah, not, not a one. What you're getting is, people are sleeping in the park. What are we going to do, Walter? I'm like, what do you mean, what are we going to do? It's perfect. Right? And so for us, these little things like that, they work. Right? And so every little project we try, that there's something, right, that we want to happen. And with the restrooms there, it's a 24-hour restroom. They can lock the front, but there's a pizzoir in the back, right? So you can go around the back, instead of peeing on the street or on a tree, there's an actual stainless steel toilet that's open 24. So it's really tough to do, though, really tough. Okay. There's La no more questions. I think we're going to continue the conversation down the street. Cool. But join me again in thanking you all. Thank you, guys.